I wanted to talk to you guys about energy today. We got to look at this thing differently than the way you normally see it. Everybody usually breaks down energy as AC and DC. What they don't understand is there's potential energy. So what do I mean by that? Let's go ahead and look at just a windmill. Every time you turn a windmill, it takes a magnet and it puts it into a coil of wire. That coil of wire gets charged. That charge in that coil of wire is potential. It is not yet AC or DC. It does show up as a sine wave, but it is not AC power. Now, everybody always talks about it. They say it acts erratically. It acts differently. You can't rely on it. It's because it's potential. Now, when you convert that with a full bridge rectifier, then you can put it into DC. Then once you put it into DC, you can convert to AC. Now, Here's the simple understanding of AC and DC. You cannot multiply AC and DC. You can convert it between volts and amps, but you cannot multiply it. However, potential is completely different. In potential, you can multiply it. You can change the values in it, as long as you do not convert it to AC or DC first. So, when it comes out, if I say a multiplier, what am I looking at? If I put a spark gap in a system and its potential energy, I can now multiply it with that spark gap. I'm going to get a higher volt. I'm going to get a higher amp out of both. So when you spark gap it several times, what happens? You start to put in multipliers in the system. So when we start talking about multiplying energy on a lot of these devices we're starting to look at, we're understanding it as potential, not AC and DC. AC and DC have rules. They're man-made. Potential is not. It's pulling the energy that's going on in the Earth. When I say Earth energy, it means potential. We are looking at energy being built. We are not looking at it in the way of how do I run my toaster? How do I run my blender? All those things. Even those are the things that will lie to you. They put it in AC, they convert it to DC, your motor is DC, your motor runs as DC, and then it runs. Your AC in your house works the same way. You want to turn on some cool air? Well, get ready for a conversion. You're going to take 220 volts, you're going to convert it into a uh, brushless DC motor, which is DC, and then that is what's going to run your air conditioner in your house. Absolutely confusing, right? Well, not really. If you really stop to think about it and take it piece by piece by piece, you start to understand it. A lot of people keep calling things AC and DC when they're not. They're actually potential. Potential can be multiplied. AC and DC cannot. It is a simple fact. When you do AC and DC, you look at conversion rates. All you're doing is changing the volts, amps, frequency, things like that, once it's in those forms. But, when you start to break those forms is when you start to understand that you can manipulate things. Now, we always look at ZVSs on this uh, show. We always look at, when we put power into a ZVS, we put it into a flyback transformer. Now, let me make this clear. I've done it several times and I'm going to do it once again here. We are looking for a different energy to come out of the flyback. It is not AC or DC. It's more of a potential energy. Now, how do we know the difference? DC is a closed loop system. It will only work when you connect the positive, goes all the way back around to the negative and keeps the loop. Now, AC is different. AC doesn't need a loop. It goes in a sine wave and it is a dangerous energy. It is a absolutely destructive energy. However, when you get the potential, it changes the game. So let's go back and let's look at that ZVS again. Now, all it's doing is putting out a pulse magnetic field. That's it. You go, okay, well, I can use a ZVS and I can heat metal. Right. That's true because you're pulsing it with a magnetic field and it's creating heat. The more amps that you put into it, the more heat it has. It's a simple conversion. That's not hard. But when you put it to a flyback, you somehow misunderstand that you're putting in a pulsed magnetic field. And that's all that you're doing. So when you put that pulse in there, 
Just understand this. You have this thing that goes in there. This is your core, right? Your core goes in like this. Now, you're wrapping coils around one part of the core here. What does that mean? You're pulsing in one field into this, into the core. It takes the core that's here. Now it's going to pulse that core. Now, because of the way these things are built, a DC flyback is built with a core here. And on the outside, they have various different clear plastics. In those clear plastics, there is a lining inside. And all that is on the film is a piece of copper. So, what is it doing? It's a one-way conversion. It acts like a diode. It sends the energy that pulses out. It cannot go pulse back in the other way. Therefore, it's a diode in one direction because you do not have enough mass of coils on those little pieces of film in order to push it back the other way. So, therefore, it only pushes one way. It's a diode. It also could be considered a resistor. Now, as it goes through there, it goes through various different spots. Every one of those spots has a little pin on the bottom, and every little pin on the bottom has a different value. Now, all that's telling you is it's a one-way conversion. It is not a two-way conversion, therefore, it cannot be a capacitor. It is absolutely a diode. So, it runs through, it hits the film on there, it hits the little strip that's on there, and that is copper, and then it gives you what is going to be a pulsed energy conversion. It is now going to convert it out of your AC or DC, and it's going to convert it now into a magnetic volt. And what do I mean by magnetic volt? All potential is, is magnetic volts. Now, this is the thing with the magnetic volt and potential to understand them in the same way. They allow you to go ahead and go through a spark gap. They let the energy jump from one thing to another. AC doesn't do that. AC stays within the wire and will zap the living daylights out of you. Trust me, done it to myself a lot. Not never on purpose though. Always, always in a bad accident. Anyway, AC stays within the wire. DC stays within the loop. You are now converting those things into a potential energy. You will get milliamps and you will get a high voltage, allowing it to cross over the spark gap. Let's go back and look at this equation again. We use a ZVS. We send that same pulse into an AC flyback. What is the AC flyback doing? Again, has the core. Now, it also has the different stages on it for the actual wire. So you got multiple stages of wire. All you're doing is pulsing individual magnetic fields in between each one. Every coil wire is its own separate magnetic field. Therefore, every time you hit one of those, it's a multiplier. Why? Because as one field goes up and it creates a field here, another one creates an overlapping field here and an overlapping field here. When they all pulse, the entire thing creates a bigger field in it. Therefore, you have a multiplier in that in your AC flyback. Now, will it still spark over? Yes, it will. However, in an AC flyback, it's not like a DC flyback. It's not going to give you as much energy coming out in the way of potential because it can jump the spark out, but it still has more amps in it than a DC flyback does. Therefore, you're going to have to add a voltage multiplier to it in order to get that volt to come up and that amp to come down. Now, some of that is in the frequency itself. When you get to a voltage multiplier, understand this. You have to use high frequency equipment there. And you can get your capacitors and your diodes. If they're not high frequency, you cannot build a voltage multiplier. It will not work. You must use high frequency. Why? Because in order to get the amps really low and then you get the voltage really high, it must use high frequency to do it. When you change the frequency, you're changing the volts and amps. Every time the frequency is high, you're allowing the voltage to go up and the amps to come down. 
That's a simple conversion in a multiplier. So we look at this. We designate them AC and DC. However, the energy coming out of them is neither one. It is potential. So when we start looking at different motors and things, let's go into that. We want to look at this in a different way. You want to see the coil. You want to see the magnet. The magnet pushes out to the coil. Now, the coil itself has potential in it. When you understand this right here, you'll start understanding the Bedini motor a little better. We need to capture that potential. We need to find every spike of that potential and put it into a capacitor. Now, Bedini motors don't have capacitors. They use batteries. Batteries pull in the energy there. However, you want to convert it to something useful in a over unity device. Use a capacitor. Now, how you use these capacitors is very important. Every time you put it into a capacitor, you're trapping the multiplier. So if you spike the energy in your system, then you want to capture that energy in that system at the spike level, not at the traditional level. So you're going to get that trickled in and it's still going to fill up the capacitor. You got to think of it as an empty bucket. The more spikes you get in there with a higher voltage, the faster the bucket fills. The more regular energy you put in there, it slowly fills up, slowly fills up. Now, you want to multiply energy, therefore you want to create every spark you can, and you want to have that to be a multiplier in your system. Anytime you spark gap it, you're setting timing in your system. You're also setting a multiplier. Now, with all that being said, you have to start using geometry in your systems. Here's how it's going to work. If I take a capacitor and I put it geometry all the way around, okay, I just make a pie shape and I put out individual pieces of the pie, right? I want to know where it goes in, in the spike, where it comes out from the capacitor. As it goes in, in the spike, you're capturing the spike at its highest level. As it starts to go out, you have a higher amount of energy coming out of it. Now, You've multiplied the energy, you've captured the multiplication of the energy, and now it comes out. So what's the geometry have to do with it? Anytime you put a ferrite core in this, just understand this, you're going to create another figure of geometry in this. It's going to create a multiplier because it's going to create a magnetic field inside of it. So you're looking at pulsing multiple magnetic fields in that geometry. Every time you do and you capture it at the spike, you're now crap capturing the energy. When we use different coils stacked one on top of the other, every time one pulses, it puts energy into another. Now we're starting to multiply the potential energy in this system as we stack them. How they go and how they pulse is going to matter to the multiplication of the energy. You cannot have cross pulses. You cannot have a pulse go here and here. They will destroy each other. That's not what you want. You want the pulses to flow. Continue to flow around. And you want to hit it just like a clock. Every time you go around it, you want that pulse to hit right on time. Right on time. Right on time. Never crossing the two when you do it. Because then you're going to have a bad energy. That's not good. Now, timing in the circuit is imperative. If you do not understand the timing in this, it will not work properly. One system has to go off so that another system can accumulate the energy. Then another system has to go off so that you can accumulate the energy again. It is about pulling the energy out of the system in the potential and not in AC and DC. AC and DC is the final step you put at the very end if you want to convert potential to energy to use everyday appliances. Potential is much different. Now, with all that being said, we sometimes build coils on this channel or we look at coils and we have to understand them. Understanding frequency is imperative to this. Frequency changes volts and amps. It'll drive you nuts. You want to create a more magnetic volt? 
it's going to have a little bit more heat and the frequency is going to go down. If you want to create more of a voltage in it so that you can capture that voltage when it spikes, then frequency goes up. We're able to capture that voltage right there. Again, this is all about transferring energy and you have to start understanding energy in a different way. If you can start seeing it like a bubble, okay? And then every time you push a part of that bubble, okay? Then you're gonna create an indent in that bubble. It comes out, goes in, every time. So if you think of it as a huge bubble here, and it's going like this, right? Always in constant motion. Always the energy in constant motion. As you press upon one side, you're gonna change the values and all the rest. Just like you're sitting there with a balloon. If I push the side of a balloon, I have now changed the whole shape of the balloon, but now I'm also gonna get an energy that pushed back on that balloon and wants to be able to fill that spot that I just pushed it. Therefore, another side will come in and push that energy. Now, it'll start changing this. Every time you do this, you're manipulating the energy. Energy does not go in linear forms in this. Energy is more like a bubble. It's a field. It moves back and forth. As you push things into it, it pushes out the other side and creates another value. As it forces itself back, because it's like a rubber band that forces itself back upon itself, therefore you're creating a different energy there. How you manipulate this energy is important if you want to create free energy. How you capture it is even more important. You want to know how to create it with your volts, amps, frequency. You're going to change magnetic values and charge values in it. Then you're going to be able to convert that over to energy that you can store in capacitors. You're also going to be able to put it into different things. Now, a lot of people run light bulbs. So, let me just say this. They look at the watts in it. Let me just tell you about a watt. A watt sometimes does not tell you the story. As a matter of fact, it likes to lie to you. So, what do I mean by that? If I put in one volt and I put in 100 amps, I am making a magnetic field. It is still 1 times 100, which equals 100. I have 100 amps. I have now lied to you about my amps. I have a magnetic field, mostly amps. However, if I put in 100 volts and I put in 1 amp, my multiplication is still the same. I still have 100 watts. Now, what's the difference? Now I've created static electricity. My watts and amps and volts are all combined in here, but the watts themselves may lie to you. Never understand watts without understanding volts and amps. Because if you do, your system will be all wrong. When I go to take your stuff and reverse engineer it, I now have to break down the voltage and amps and frequency in order to understand your watts. If you're just going for joules of energy, I completely understand. The mass amount of energy in the system comes out to joules, and then you're able to maneuver, maneuver from there. However, to rebuild your project, I must understand how that watt is built. Because the wattage alone is a lie, when it comes to volts, amps, and frequency, you're going to have to understand what kind of values we're looking at here. Do we want a charge? Do we want a magnetic field? Do we want to go something different? Do we want to get static electricity? All of those things matter. It's okay to put it in watts as long as you understand that you're only doing it to put in the total amount of energy in a system. Reverse engineering makes you tear every single thing down to its final component or where it started from. Then you can understand how to do these things. This is why a lot of people misunderstand these projects. We're dealing in potential energy here. We are not dealing in AC and DC a lot of times. We're dealing it with it before we get to the step of AC and DC. So we're able to multiply that factor. A lot of people come in with their rules. Well, it's AC and well, you cannot multiply AC and you cannot multiply DC. Well, that, that's great. I'm not arguing that point. 
I'm taking potential and I'm changing it. And because I'm changing the potential energy, I'm changing everything. Now, here's the part that's going to destroy your mind because people can't seem to get over this. If I tell you I have a flyback and I tell you I have a testicle coil, is there a difference? Just think about it for a minute. Is there a difference? Do you really understand what you're dealing with here? If I told you that I had a ferrite core and all I'm doing in that little core is I'm taking a coil and I'm pulsing the core and then I'm pulsing the coil. That's it. I'm oscillating between the two. I am simply oscillating right between the two. Now you look at a Tesla coil. I have a coil that's the number one coil on the outside. I have a number two coil going down the center. I'm simply oscillating. I'm creating one magnetic volt to, under, to go in and manipulate the second one in order to get the thing to work. It's simple oscillation. Both procedures are the same. So people ask, can you use a ZVS to create either one of them? The answer is yes. One of the reasons I'm doing ZVS Tesla coils is because they're so, the, so much the same as a flyback. The energy going in is exactly the same. We're just putting a pulse in there. That's all we're doing. We're putting a pulse in there in order to show it. Now, how do you know that they're the same? Well, can I put a musical signal into both? Yeah, I can. It's not very hard. All you have to do is set up a trigger circuit in either one of them. It is simply a circuit that takes your high voltage on one side. It now takes your low voltage on the other. And all you're doing is you're taking this signal from your low voltage, which is going to be your music signal, and you're adding it to your higher voltage. It then wraps itself around that higher voltage, and it will combine with it, and it'll come out the end of either a Tesla coil or a flyback. They call it a music circuit. It is simple. $8.99 on Amazon, you can get five of them on a low voltage circuit, and they're cheap and easy. We've already figured this out. So, it tries to tell you something when you're talking about AC and DC. It's much different than potential. Some things are exactly the same. And only when you can break down the fundamentals of them are you going to start to understand this. I see the flyback is the same as the Tesla coil. One's just a bigger version of the other. So, let's throw you for another loop because there's not enough in here apparently. When we start to see things in ancient Egypt, they come up like this. Then they stop. Okay, we got a plate. We now have a space in between that's smaller. Then we have another plate. Okay, then we have a space in between. You're going, wow, that looks like a Tesla coil, but on top of the Tesla coil, what looks like a flyback, uh, flyback coil right there. You're going, man, can I make a Tesla coil like that? Absolutely, you can. All you have to know is exactly how much wire goes into it so that you can hit the multiplier in it. You must oscillate. Now, you could do force oscillation, which is the ZVS circuit to the flyback, or you, have, or you could do the Tesla coil oscillation, which is a simple oscillation between the primary and secondary. Now, if you get the correct amount of frequency in there, doing the Tesla coil is easy. So why does forced oscillation work as well? It is the whole reason that you're doing the Slayer Exciter circuit. You are doing forced oscillation. That circuit is the same thing that you're going to use to take a ZVS and make it work. When you put it into the, you go from the ZVS, you go into a flyback, you're going to put in forced oscillation. So, can I use the Slayer Exciter circuit to turn on a flyback? The answer is yes. It's not very hard. You see a lot of videos out there that, don't, that do this thing. Now, there's a lot of different ways to get to the end goal, but I'm trying to impress upon you a simple thing. If you can understand energy, there is nothing you can't do. When you fail to see where energy starts, where you fail to see the conversion, and you fail to see that when it goes from 
potential to AC and DC, you start to have a problem. When you cannot get your mind out of AC and DC, you'll never understand potential. You must understand all three. You must be able to manipulate voltage and create different points of spikes of energy and capture those spikes. That's what's going to give you your multipliers. The earth does this naturally. The earth itself has electricity that comes out of it. We see it as lightning. Sometimes lightning kills. Sometimes it doesn't. It all depends on how it was converted from potential into what signal it comes out as. You're going to get hit with an AC voltage if it goes to a certain part in the clouds. If it doesn't, you're going to get hit with potential. Both are completely lethal, but the energy that's hitting you is completely different. So you're going to have a different response to it. Sometimes people live, sometimes people don't. Why? It depends on what they get hit with. So the last thing you want on your body is metal that allows it to convert from a potential to an AC, which will just fry you. And that's the worst thing. So when we start to look at our gravity projects, we have to start to understand something in energy. If I wanted to create an energy flow, I do it all the time. I call them halo bridges. I call them plasma projects, whatever you want to say. If you take the CVS, you put it to a DC flyback. Now, add as much frequency as it will take before it breaks down. And what you want to do is put two, th two objects, one twice the size of the other, and then you have to have one that has spikes on it or something with no paint. Now, you're going to get a flow between the two. It's going to hiss. It's going to shh all the time. Now, when you get that, you're going to get a plasma bridge or a plasma flow. That is a very simple thing to understand. You can't see it during the day. You turn off the lights, you can see it. Now, just understand the earth in this way. You have the plasma flow. What happens when I stretch that? I no longer get the hiss. However, it doesn't mean that the energy is not still getting there. The energy still gets there. Here's the hiss. Here's the, where you can see it. When I pull it apart, the energy is still getting there. What did I just do? I just changed the amount of distance. Therefore, I've changed the energy from a hissing sound and a flow of wind. And now I've now converted it into charge. I have now changed the system. I now create it as a charge. Now, as that energy flows down, it's going to get onto something. As it gets onto something, it's going to add weight to it because it's adding charge. The bigger you are, the more charge you're going to have on you the more it's going to force you down to the earth. That's how this works. So how do you break it? How do you change it? You have to change the frequency. You have to create a resonance chamber. That's what's going to break it from going there. You do not want to be in the same frequency. You want to change it. Things are changed when you change the frequency. I always say put horses on a bridge. So as the horse goes across the bridge, it's not because they dislike horses. It's because they are hooves. Consistency in sound creates a resonance chamber. Now, it doesn't have chamber around it. Okay, so it sounds wrong, but it's right. It's this consistent sound of the same exact frequency going off again, 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 again. It messes up nature. It will distort a bridge and destroy it. That's what you need to understand here. If we're creating something to go against gravity, resonance is the key to break it. You must change the frequency and you must consistently change the frequency inside of a resonance chamber. We understand this in beetles. When you look at the beetle shells, they have a bunch of little hairs come off, right? So they're picking up the frequencies in those little hairs. They go into the shell. Now, as they go into there, now you're taking the frequency that's going into the little hairs and you're bringing it into the shell. 
the shell is like an echo chamber inside there. It keeps taking the frequency going, going, going. It's making an amount of energy inside it that was greater than what came into it. That's what a resonance chamber does. So, now it has all this potential energy. Now, on the outside of the shell, you're starting to get a field that forms around the entire thing. This right here is one of the greatest things to understanding the shell, and that's why people talk about it. They don't describe it very well. You have to understand resonance chambers in order to understand it. You're going to have to expand your field on all of this type of energy in order to get to the next level. Resonance chambers are absolutely amazing. And anytime that you can put it in there, it'll change your whole project. We deal with it in the gravity flyer all the time. The flat plate that goes across it in the center is the resonance chamber. It doesn't have a whole lot of anything in it. It's just flat. But what it does is it compiles frequencies in there. And it continues to do it on a consistent basis. Therefore, we have the same thing we have as horses on a bridge. It is now going to take the same frequencies that consistently goes in there, and it's going to amplify. It's such a big understanding, guys. If you can get to that level where you can start understanding energy the way I described it today, then a lot of these projects are going to start to become simple. It's just a matter of how you want to do it. It's not a matter of how to create it. We've already created all the energies that we need. All we need to do is understand them. There's a real science formula behind all this, and I'm working on putting it all together so I can write a paper on doing it. However, I need everybody to start understanding the energy is different. When we start converting in all these different projects from potential to AC and DC, you're going to have to start to understand this. You're going to have to understand the geometry. Look at a simple resonance chamber for a um, microwave, right? It's set with every little thing around it, right? All the little posts are around it. And it creates the same amount of frequency in each little chamber that it has. Therefore, it multiplies. It's that simple. You're creating energy that comes in in the post, and then you have the other part that wraps around it. It now has energy there. The energy doesn't have a place to go until you add the frequency to it. The frequency then makes it spin. The spin itself puts more energy into the system. The frequency controls how the voltage comes out. You get a microwave at it. So if you look at a physics demonstration of energy, you can go from a microwave to a static volt. You can go from all that stuff to a laser. It all depends on how you manipulate the energy. Guys, this is known stuff. It's just hard to put it all together. You have to look at so many different avenues of how it's being created in order to understand it. But once you do, manipulating energy becomes easy. It changes the entire game. You ever want to build a Tesla coil with the number one coil inside of it? It's possible. It changes the whole way you look at Tesla coils. We're looking at them right now as two simple units. I got a one, number one coil and I got a number two coil. What if I change the game on you? What if I can manipulate that and change the energy altogether? As long as I stay in the same resonance frequency, I can change it. What happens when you look at things like you, you want to create a resonance chamber inside of an earth? Okay. It depends on your degrees of angles inside that. Why is it always I say that the earth is probably has a resonance chamber inside? Because it creates energy, heat, plasma, everything that you wanted is in that resonance chamber. A ball of magma does not. It gives you one effect. It will give you a rotational magnetic field. That's it. You're not going to get everything else that you want out of it. You're not going to get your plasma that goes around the earth. You're not going to get your field. You're not going to get your gravity. All of those things have to come in when the energy comes together. The frequency, volts, amps, all changes. It changes the charge to magnetic field. Okay? This is an understanding of a magnetosphere that needs to be known. It's not just the chemical process that goes on in there, guys. It has to do with frequency. The entire planet is not solid. For those of you who think it is, it's not. 
It's built up of different chambers, and in every single chamber it makes a different sound. They used to look at this when they, uh, when anytime you look at any of the ancient stuff, you can see a chamber on the ground and a bell structure above it. Do you understand what that's for? If the frequency in the chamber matches the frequency of the bell, the bell will turn on. That's as simple as it gets. That's how you need to understand the frequencies of things. So when we start dealing with all kinds of different projects that have to do with UFOs, you can deal with the U-tron. You guys ever look at that? What is a U-tron? Well, it's hollow in the center, but it's actually a square when you look at it one way, and it's like a diamond shape when you look at it the other. Okay, but what is it doing? You have a C-shaped capacitor that goes over it and it creates a magnetic field on to the aluminum right there. Aluminum hates magnetic fields. It hates magnetism. It then keeps it off of it. However, what's going on on the inside of it? You say you fill it with liquid. You fill it with this. Fill it with that. It's a resonance chamber. It absolutely is a resonance chamber. Why do you think Carr describes his device as a sound device? It's a resonance chamber. He's creating resonance. That's what he's doing in there. Resonance is going to multiply everything in your system. It is a multiplier you're not accounting for. You're thinking of it as like a free energy device. It, it's not necessarily that. It's the fact that he's putting frequency into it. And that frequency now, it's going to change this whole system. So they say there, there's not a wiring diagram to this. Do, do you need a lot? Do, do you? There's not that many wires that are in this thing. If he's telling you he's taking the potential from the sky itself when he gets up in the atmosphere, understand this. That has to go somewhere. It has to go somewhere into a system. Therefore, his C-shaped capacitor is tied to the frame of this whole thing. As you put energy into the outside of this thing, it goes into the C-shaped capacitor, which then goes into the U-tron. Now, you take that potential energy, you put it into a capacitor, which is on the center plate there. The capacitor fills up. It then drives a Tesla coil in the center, and you create the loop again. It is not that difficult. I built it years ago. As a matter of fact, I gave it away. Never knew I was going to do a YouTube channel on all this stuff, guys. But that's how it flows. That's a simple thing. He's creating a giant resonance device, and inside his giant resonance device, it has a ton of potential in there. He is not trying to do anything more than that. This is why UFOs are hard to understand for people because we're dealing with a lot of potential energy, not so much AC and DC. When I try to suck energy into this thing and I try to create a bubble in my gravity flyer, guys, I'm pulling potential in. I want it to charge to the surface of the earth. I want the potential charge to come in there, okay? I want to now take that charge that's coming in and I want to convert it. I want to be able to take that charge and immediately convert it to a magnetic field within a second or less. Hey, we're talking milliseconds sometimes. I want a conversion rate. I want to trap that energy. I want to use it in a different way. But because I know I can change things based on frequency, amps, volts, and then charge, I can now take that charge and manipulate it towards volts or amps and frequency inside my machine. It's one of the truest understandings of energy there is. We're going to end up dealing with a lot more on this subject. But please understand this. When we identify AC and DC, they can't be multiplied. Potential can. Are you dealing with potential in your system or are you dealing with AC and DC? The laws are completely different in dealing with them. Can you amplify AC and DC and create multipliers in it? No, you cannot. Can you store the energy and use it later in those systems? Yes, you can. Can you multiply energy and potential? Yes, you can. You have to start to understand this to understand the whole thing. If you can do this, if you can get it out of your head of what AC and DC is compared to potential, then you're going to be able to make the next leap into what you're doing. If you can't, if you have to put everything in a box, you will be the person inside the box. Right now, the way I'm describing it, I'm the man out standing outside the box right now. I'm looking in at you. Now, the next level to understanding all this 
is we're going to end up taking the box and throwing it away. And then we will truly understand energy. That point, I can't wait for. Anyway, if you like what you saw today, please like, share, subscribe, comment, do all those fun things, and have yourself a great day. Thank you.